When Putin and other senior Russian officials talk about multipolar world, yes, they are using language that has been developed over a couple of decades, etc. But they definitely mean it in an anti-West, anti-US way. I'm Roland Oliphant and this is Battle Lines. It's Friday, October the 25th. We cannot allow ourselves to become numb to the suffering, and I will not be silent. President Zelensky has for the first time acknowledged that his forces are conducting a cross-border offensive inside Russia. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. On today's episode, we check in with Russia correspondent James Kilner about why dozens of world leaders are meeting in Russia and Vladimir Putin's plans for a new world order. Then we chat to East Asia correspondent Nicholas Smith about how North Korean troops in Ukraine could have major implications in the Western Pacific. This week, the leaders of China, India, Brazil, South Africa, the United Arab Emirates, Iran and several others gathered in the Russian city of Kazan for a summit that Vladimir Putin claimed heralds the emergence of a new anti-Western world order. And it comes the same week as voters in Moldova and Georgia go to the polls in elections that have been described as pivotal battles for influence between Russia and the West. Seldom has the global confrontation between these two international camps been so vividly illustrated. The Telegraph's Russia correspondent James Kilner is in Kazan and I asked him what it's like being back in Russia and whether the geopolitical balance of power really is changing before our eyes. It is a rather significant diplomatic week in the former Soviet Union. In the city of Kazan, a few hundred miles east of Moscow, Vladimir Putin has gathered a very large number of world leaders for the BRICS summit. It was once a club that referred to Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China and South Africa. It's now massively expanded and it's at the center of really a big Russian diplomatic push on a kind of geopolitical scale, really. Our Russia correspondent, James Kilner, is in Kazan. James, how are you? And and what can you tell us about both the rationale for this meeting and how it's going? Because there's been some pretty interesting high-level meetings, not just including Vladimir Putin, but with other countries getting together. Hi, Roland. So, yeah, it's great to be back in Russia. In many ways, this is the newspaper's first time back since the war started in February 22. So it's exciting to be back. It's important to be back, looking at what's going on inside Russia and, and getting a feel for it and talking to people in the streets. And as you say, being here at the BRICS summit in Kazan, where Putin is... So he's using this BRICS summit to sort of posture on the world stage and to show the West that he's not isolated, etc. Uh, I'll come on to that in a minute. As, as for Kazan itself, security is incredibly tight. Um, you've got a lot of police on all the streets. You've got normal traffic police. Uh, you've got uh, special forces with Kalashnikovs slung over their shoulders and bristling with am- ammunition belts, etc., telling you what you can and can't do. The uh, jamming equipment is so hardcore here because Ukrainian drone attacks have closed the airport here, even on the eve of the conference. So the anti-drone jamming equipment is so hard that often you get a very poor reception. So the Russians are not taking anything for granted. They know this is a a major conference and they know that Ukraine will be watching it and they're looking to potentially upset it. As you said, there's Peter's managed to pull in about 36 leaders from different countries to get over here. He has used the BRICS format as a platform to show the world that he has allies. Now, BRICS, as you said, was set up in 2009. It was a relatively sort of backwater club for the five five major economies outside the West to get together once a year and have a chit-chat about things. But uh, Russia took on the rotating chat at the beginning of this year and immediately in January, four countries joined up. That was the UAE, Ethiopia, Iran and Egypt and Saudi Arabia became a sort of observer state. So that was the first expansion. And this week we're looking at, we're not 100% sure, but up to 12 countries, up to 12 more countries we think are going to sign up. This is sort of countries like Sri Lanka looking for better economic deals with Russia to Burkina Faso, who is looking for sort of support for its military junta, which uh, took power in a coup. 
Uh, there's also talk of Turkey, which is a NATO member state, joining up, which would uh, definitely rock the boat. And uh, also Azerbaijan, which now supplies a lot of uh, the gas to the EU and is a major BP production center. So very interesting here. This is all like high level international diplomacy playing out in front of us. And for the first time, this is the really important bit, really, for the first time, the Kremlin, which is obviously very confident at the moment on the battlefields in Ukraine, has overtly linked BRICS and the Ukraine war. So we found out, yes, I think it was, Putin's top aide said that the, the Ukraine issue had been touched upon at an informal dinner the night before between the BRICS leaders, and that there would be a reference to Ukraine in the final communique as well. So Putin is overtly using BRICS now to build an anti-Western economic bloc with some estimates say 40, 45% of the world's population, 30, 35% of the world's GDP. There's a lot of concrete specifics I'd like to get into. And I think it's very interesting how the Iranians, for example, are also using this as a, as a networking opportunity and, and so on. But where do you draw the line between the kind of PR, the stunt, the theatre of okay, we've got a big summit and this shows that I am not isolated and so on, and the substance, the actual concrete diplomatic geopolitical significance of this. Because on the one hand, you can't sneeze at a gathering where Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin and Mohammed bin Zayed of UAE and Masoud Pesashkian of Iran are all in the same room. On the other hand, these are countries with very different roles and views. They're not all on the same page diplomatically or militarily, even economically. So how significant is this in practical terms? I think BRICS has always been used as a meeting sort of ground forum for these different countries outside the West, and that's definitely been the case in the last few days. So it's been a three-day conference. The current BRICS leaders arrived on Tuesday, and they all had bilateral meetings with Putin. So he has been using it heavily as a sort of a bilateral sounding ground. And then yesterday, Modi and Xi met, Indian Prime Minister and, and the Chinese President, met for an official bilateral meeting for the first time in five years. China and India are uh, sort of a conflict over border areas around the Kashmir region. So, I mean, there, there is a genuine, real sense here that high-level diplomacy is being done and various, various other meetings. I'd like to say Iran, for Iran, this is a very important sounding area as well. Iran's one of the few countries with, which has set up a permanent like a press area in the corner of, of one of the rooms with the, with the Iranian sort of colours and flags and some sofas. So they are doing a lot of media around this as well. BRICS has definitely got the aura of an anti-West get-together, even though you might think, oh, well, the UAE or India in, in many ways is an anti-West, but they are here and they are taking part. Mm. Um, of course, the Russians have talked for a long time. Vladimir Putin referenced this in his comments at the conference. He talked about this shows that the multipolar world is finally taking shape. And I mentioned this on Ukraine the latest just the other day, that a you know, multipolar world isn't a phrase that comes out of nowhere. It's something that Vladimir Putin and Russian diplomats have been going on for about for literally decades. And the idea is we had this unipolar moment after the end of the Cold War. Where the United States was a indisputed global superpower, and it's meant to carry this slightly democratizing tone, this idea that other nations around the world could be sovereign or, or govern stuff. Fair to say that the Russians are finally seeing that dream come to fruition here, or is that phrase simply shorthand for anti-Western and another aspect of, of the war effort in Ukraine? My view is that the, the war in Ukraine is the absolute priority for the Kremlin. I think they see everything through that prism, and they have done for two and a half, maybe even longer, three years, whatever, four years. So I think when Putin and other senior Russian officials are talking about multipolar world, yes, they are using language that has been developed over a couple of decades, etc. But they definitely mean it in an anti-West, anti-US way, for example, when the Russian propaganda creeps into to West Africa and uh, all the Wagner mercenaries and, and uh, all the other mercenaries since, and they're, they're encouraging these coups, etc., they still talk about a multipolar world, but they late it through with strong anti-Western rhetoric about colonialism, etc. So yes, there is definitely a vibe when they talk about multipolar, about democracy and about freedom, but they are also using it, I think, as shorthand to, to talk about anti-Western attitudes and policies. It's interesting that this is happening this week. And 
to bring it slightly closer to Russia's borders in a way. We're still talking about the international sea and international diplomacy. But this is the week of two key elections in former Soviet states. Last weekend, there was both a presidential election and a referendum on future EU membership, basically, in Moldova, which was a much, much narrower margin for the yes vote, the pro-EU vote, than was expected. And this weekend on Saturday, there is also going to be a parliamentary election in Georgia. And both of those votes have been described as not just about votes for ordinary Georgian and, and Moldovan voters, but, but in terms of showdowns of confrontations between the West and Russia, I've seen commentators saying that what happens in Saturday on Georgia will be pivotal or decide whether Georgia is going to be in the pro-Russian camp or in the, the European camp. The Russians and the West have both accused one another of interference in both of those elections. Could you tell us a little bit about those two votes and how you see that dovetailing with this apparent Russian agenda of rallying an anti-Western global bloc? I think they're different issues to BRICS. Let's be clear about that. Neither Moldova or Georgia are, are here. I have to say that as well. They are part of the sort of wider Russian diplomatic influence pressure. But what they are going through this week or on Sunday and uh, last week on Sunday and Saturday are internal stresses and strains exacerbated by Kremlin influence and, and the war in Ukraine, of course. So starting with Georgia, this has been bubbling for a long time. The Georgian dream is the, the government. They are bankrolled by Bazzini Ivanishvili, Georgia's richest man. He's a billionaire. He earned his cash in Russia in the 1990s. He came back to Georgia, I can't remember exactly, 2010, 2011, to basically set up a, the Georgian dream to upseat the uh, very pro-West Mikhail, um, and he succeeded. And, and but these votes were considered legitimate, etc. And the Georgian dream has governed Georgia since uh, 2012, and it is facing another election now. Basically, it's facing a very splintered, disparate group of pro-Western opposition parties. Now... There have been protests through the year in Georgia because the Georgian dream has increasingly imposed Kremlin-inspired laws which have irritated and upset a lot of people for obvious reasons. The standout one of these is the so-called uh, foreign agents law, where NGOs, etc., who receive a certain proportion of their income from overseas, have to register with uh, a government body, and this gives the government more oversight and effectively control where, where NGOs receive their cash from, etc., and close down NGOs it doesn't really like. This triggered huge street protests and clashes with police. There have been other laws as well, which have been inspired by Kremlin, like an anti-LGBT law came in a few weeks ago. There's also a law which effectively makes Georgia an offshore cash haven, etc. All this has hugely irritated the EU, which has basically told Georgia that you can't become an EU member to sort the wars out. So it's irritated the EU, and it's, it's dragged up a lot of angle on the streets. Those are the optics. Georgia is also politically split. It has a pro-Western residence, Salome Zubarashvili, who was born in France and used to be the French ambassador to Georgia before she moved into politics. She's been speaking out openly against the Georgian dream prime minister and, and, and the government. So, so that's basically the same. We've got this election coming up on Saturday. No one quite knows which way it's going to go. I, I would definitely expect the Georgian dream to, to use its network to pressure to, to have buy votes and, and pressure people to vote one way or the other. But, and this is a really important point, Rayland, it still actually has a very strong supporter base in the country. It sets itself up as a sort of the traditional party of traditional values in Georgia. And Georgia's society is essentially very conservative. And this is what they want to hear as well. They paint the opposition, the pro-Western opposition, as far too liberal for Georgian tastes, you know, moving far too fast towards the, the EU, etc. So you know, it, it does have genuine support. Also, Russia has basically rewarded the Georgian dream and Georgia for staying out of the war in Ukraine. It's improved links, it's re-established travel links, it improved business links, it improved student links, etc. So people also see that as a, as a benefit. The EU has been hugely supporting opposition. And it, it is actually one of the ground zero places for this influence battle between uh, the West and the Kremlin. 
So, yeah, very interesting times in, in Georgia. As for Moldova, again, it's also been a sort of ground zero of this influence battle between the West and the Kremlin, but in a different way. So the pro-Western president there, Maya Sandu, she has been pushing Moldova hard to join the EU and made a formal application in 2022 after the Ukraine invasion by Russia. Moldova feels very vulnerable. It's wedged between Ukraine and Romania. A large sliver of its formerly main industrial base, Transnistria, is controlled by the Kremlin. It doesn't actually share a border with Russia, and need to make that clear to your listeners. But the Kremlin does have huge levers it can pull in Moldova. There's a large Russian-speaking minority. There's a large Russian eth- ethnic minority as well who sent there during the Soviet Union. And it has important business levers as well. There's one particular oligarch who was accused of fraud, embezzlement, etc. in 2019 who fled to Russia. Ilan Shaw, who who has still retained strong networks in Moldova. And it's through these channels that the West and the Maya Sandu have accused the Kremlin of trying to buy off the election, buy votes, influence people, etc. In the run-up to this, like you say, this referendum and presidential election on Sunday, all the guards at the airport were saying they were confiscating bundles of cash from people coming in from Russia, which was incredibly unusual, like eight, ten thousand euros at a time sort of thing. And there have been various heavily reported instances of vote buying and the Moldovan security services with confirmation from the US said that the Russians have spent about 150 million euros or something in that region trying to buy off votes. And they think as many as targeting up to 300,000 people, I think the numbers were. In a country of three million people, that's an awful lot. And reading between the lines, Maya Sandy basically confirmed this at a, at a very angry and irritated post-referendum press conference on Sunday. The referendum came in very tight indeed. It was 50.4% in favour of tweaking the constitution to allow Moldova to join the EU. So 50.4% were in favour of that. 49.6% against that. And I think that was a shock. It was so close. This is the point, isn't it? Because everything ahead of that was suggesting it was going to be almost, a, or if not a landslide, a much bigger yes vote. So people were somewhat taken aback by that. Absolutely. I think it was predicted at 60-40 and came in at essentially 50-50. It was way too tight for comfort. And that will have rocked Sandy's credibility inside Moldova and perhaps even with the EU. It does mean, though... It's a clear in or out. So it does mean, though, that the Moldova moves along on its EU uh, ascension journey. But this incredibly tight that shows how vulnerable Moldova is to these sort of influence campaigns. At the same time, she also failed to win a majority in the first round of the presidential election. She took 42.45. So she won 40. 2.5-ish percent, and people had been hoping she'd get over the line in the first round. It was, it was still, well, will she, won't she? But 42.5% was considered a bit low as well. The important thing here is that her challenger, uh, former prosecutor, he is supported by pro-Russia, pro-socialist opposition parties. And the analyst I spoke to said that Sandy is actually going to have a bit of a tough time defeating him in the second round. So she's got to find another 8% or so of the population to vote for her. And they were saying that is not going to be straightforward. That's happening first weekend in November, I think. So that is definitely another date to watch out for as, as we sort of monitor what's going on around the former Soviet Union. It's an incredibly interesting time for this region and how they navigate through criminal influence and, and the impact of the Ukraine war. Mm, that election will be on November the 3rd. That's Sunday week from when we're talking. We will definitely be following that. James, thank you so much for joining us. I must say, in a way, I don't envy you. I find conference journalism really frustrating, but it must have been fascinating. What have been your your highlights and what are you looking forward to on, I believe it's the last day as we're speaking now? Conference journalism is a pain in the neck and we are shepherded out into one end of this huge conference centre. Can't get anywhere near any of the engagements. There is a Putin presser coming up afternoon, so that'll be interesting if he does go ahead with that. 
I, I think it's been fascinating being here and seeing the Kremlin operation, international diplomacy operation. I think it's really important that the Telegraph came back and got back into Russia and had a look around. James Kilner, thank you very much for joining us from Kazan. Now, on Thursday morning, Russia's State Duma, the lower house of parliament, ratified a mutual defence pact with North Korea, paving the way for North Korean troops to fight inside Russia against Ukraine. They would be the first foreign troops to enter the war on either side since Russia's invasion began two years ago, but it could also have dramatic repercussions well beyond Europe. I asked East Asia correspondent Nicholas Smith about why Kim Jong-un would want to enter a war on the other side of the world and what it might mean for security on the Korean peninsula itself and the Western Pacific as a whole. Nikki, you've been reporting on North Korea for years. You've been to Pyongyang. What is your read on this? And we know that the Russians are going to get from this. They're going to get troops to fight in their war. But what on earth is Kim Jong-un going to get out of this? Well, first of all, this hasn't happened in a vacuum. This has been bubbling for at least a year where Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin have really been strengthening their ties. They've been closing up to each other. They have been extending their military cooperation with each other, which has really worried Western capitals as well as regional capitals in the Indo-Pacific. South Korea is very worried about it and, and so is Japan. And so last year, we already saw Kim Jong-un take his bulletproof train to go to Russia's Far East to meet with Vladimir Putin. And it's believed that's when they made an agreement for Pyongyang to send artillery shells to Russia. And so it's believed that up to 8 million artillery shells have been sent, as well as anti-tank missiles, ballistic missiles, to help Russia's war effort. And at that time, there were reports that in exchange for doing this, that Russia would provide military technology to North Korea, including satellite technology. North Korea really wanted to launch satellites, which would help with its nuclear weapons program, and also technology that could help for its ambitions to have nuclear-powered submarines. And so there's the technical side and the military cooperation side that could be of benefit to Kim Jong-un. We don't know if this technology was transferred or not. But as well as that, if North Korea sends its troops to Russia, if they end up in Ukraine, they could also gain combat experience that they have not had for decades. Um, They could gain intelligence on Russia's military know-how. And that is of an immediate concern to South Korea, which is still technically at war with North Korea. It's been technically at war since the 1950s, even though there has been no military action between them. But as well as that, for Kim Jong-un, there's a personal benefit. He wants legitimacy. He wants to be seen on the global stage as a statesman. For years, he's been viewed as a madman trying to, to build up his nuclear weapons arsenal and running a pariah state. And, and he wants status. He, he also, not only internationally, but he also wants to sell this image to his people that he is globally important. This deprivation that they're living in, lack of human rights, food insecurity is somehow worth it because North Korea is a big player on the global stage and that he is leading the country to be a a more important player on the world stage, one that the other countries fear and respect. So for him, it just gives him more political legitimacy at home. What is the potential fallout here for the Korean peninsula itself? You You mentioned their combat experience. Of course, this security pact they've signed seems to go both ways. Right? So it seems to oblige Russia to come to North Korea's aid in the event of war as well. Does this have implications for security in the Western Pacific as well as in Europe? Really what we've seen in the past year or so is a kind of shift of geopolitical alliances in the Indo-Pacific, in East Asia. You have this growing relationship between Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin. It's in their mutual interests to have a deeper alliance. They see this opportunity to upset Washington's policies in Ukraine and in the Indo-Pacific. 
to be disruptors. At the same time, the US has also been forging deeper ties with Japan and South Korea. Um, those ties are long running, but it's really strengthened that trilateral relationship. South Korea historically has tried to keep Russia on side to rein in North Korea's nuclear weapons ambitions, its aggression. But really, since the start of the Ukraine war, we've seen Russia, which is still a member of the UN Security Council, just completely renege on that. It's not upholding international sanctions, the UN sanctions that have been applied um, to North Korea over its nuclear weapons program. And so that relationship that South Korea was trying to keep balanced is really completely out of kilter, which is pushing South Korea just in the past few days to say it would consider possibly sending arms supplies directly to Ukraine, which so far it has not done. So we're seeing a shift in power, in allegiances, and increasingly Russia and North Korea combining their forces to thwart US interests and the interests of America's allies as well. Where is China in all this? They're the other big player in this part of the world, and traditionally they're North Korea's chief sponsor. What does Beijing make of this? So it was very hard to tell what Beijing's thinking, but China really acts in its own interests, and it won't be happy with any kind of increasing instability on the Korean peninsula. It will likely be mistrustful of Kim Jong-un's deepening ties with Vladimir Putin because it wants to be the most influential country over North Korean affairs. It's North Korea's biggest trading partner. And so it's wielded a lot of influence over Pyongyang. And, and if that influence diminishes, then that will make Beijing nervous. China has tried to position itself as a peace broker in the war in Ukraine, although it has also been accused by the United States and others of sending Russia dual-use technology that's helping the Russian war effort. China denies this. So really, China won't want to see any moves that destabilize the region around its own borders. It certainly won't want to see North Korea's nuclear program growing if Russia is supporting Pyongyang with nuclear expertise, then China will not be happy with that. And China wants to take the lead. So it will be uncomfortable with any other alliances that could challenge that lead or China's desire to dominate the region and also to push itself as some kind of broker in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Nicholas Smith, thank you very much Indeed, we should say, of course, and Nicola was talking about nuclear technology, Ukrainians have claimed that North Korea has asked for assistance with tactical nuclear weapons from Russia, but we have absolutely no evidence to, to back that up. As Nicola said, we don't know whether any such transfers have taken place. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph created by David Knowles. To stay on top of all our news analysis and dispatches from the ground in Israel and Gaza, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we're relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is a part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Battle Lines' sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. This episode of Battle Lines was produced by David Dakari and Louisa Wells.